Good day, good afternoon to everyone who are joining us here. This is Everything Connected, a webinar for the fifth anniversary of Laudato C on care for our common home. Hello, my name is Kevin Turf. I'm happy to be your host today and uh, would like to welcome you all to this event to celebrate uh, Laudato C. Uh, these are the organizations that are sponsoring the Environment Ministry of St. Francis Xavier Church in New York City, Metro New York Catholic Climate Movement, and the Thomas Berry Forum for Ecological Dialogue. We are co-sponsored today by Catholic Charities Department of Social and Community Development with the Archdiocese of New York, and also the Environmental Justice Task Force with the Archdiocese of Newark. Uh, today, our moderator is Brother Kevin Colley. He is Executive Director of the Thomas Berry Forum for Ecological Dialogue at Iona College. And Kevin serves as United Nations Headquarters in New York City as the main representative of Edmund Rice International, ERI, and he produces a monthly newsletter for this organization on environmental concerns. Um, we would like to let you know we'll be, uh, have several remarkable speakers from across the country will be joining us uh, for the next 90 minutes and we'll be taking questions later on in the chat box. So at this time I'd like to turn it over to Brother Kevin Collins. Thank you Kevin and uh, thank you all for being with us today on a very beautiful uh, Sunday afternoon here in New York. Now this is uh, everything is connected which is an important word, uh, set of words to remember about uh, this encyclical. And it's one of the things that I think Pope Francis has been most uh, consistent about. Everything is connected. We're celebrating the fifth anniversary at this time of Laudato Si on care for our common home. Uh, this webinar is only one of many events that will be happening in this year of the celebration. And then we'll be continuing the celebration as we move into the next interval. Uh, the program today, as uh, Kevin has mentioned, has two wonderful speakers, and we'll be getting to them in a few minutes. Uh, the background is uh, one person is from science and one person is from uh, theology, so it's going to give us uh, those two perspectives at least today. A little something to start with, if you don't mind, we'll take a moment for a prayer. Creator God, be present to those in need in these trying times, especially the poorest and those most at risk of being left behind. Transform our fear and feelings of isolation into hope and fraternity so that we may experience a true conversion of heart. Help us to show creative solidarity in addressing the consequences of this global pandemic. Help us to listen to the cry of our brothers and sisters who are suffering from racial injustice. Make us courageous to embrace the changes that are needed in search of the common good. Now, more than ever, may we feel that we are all interconnected and interdependent. Enable us to listen and respond to the cry of the earth and the cry of the poor. And may the present sufferings be the birth pangs of a more fraternal and sustainable world. For this we pray, amen. To refresh, we, uh, we know that the encyclical was uh, signed on uh, May 24th, and many of us have already celebrated that anniversary. But today we're close to the date of June 18, when the encyclical was released to the public with all of the translations and with great fanfare. Um, the, our two speakers today will be the main part of the program. They'll be followed by three short presentations about work being done on the ground to bring Laudato Si to life in the New York metro area. We'll be taking your questions. Please put them in the chat box and they'll be uh, monitored by uh, Kevin Turpin. He'll 
let us hear from those later on. Uh, the context for the encyclical, first of all, it's a letter from the Pope, usually just to Catholic community, but in this case, Pope Francis was at great pains to say it's to the whole world. He wants to enter into dialogue with everyone about a pressing concern. Now, at the time that Laudato came out, the earth was warming at an alarming rate. World leaders were having annual meetings about the issues. You may have heard about the intergovernmental panels on climate change uh, supported by the United Nations. We were also working at that time on sustainable development goals, SDGs, to end poverty throughout the world and ended up with 17 of these goals and they were related to how Francis was making his mark with Laudato Si. The renewal of the commitment for the Sustainable Development Goals for the next 10 years is coming up. Uh, we had uh, the sequence in June of 2015, Pope Francis released his encyclical, Laudato Si, on care for our common home. That summer, July, the UN finished three years of negotiations on the 17 Sustainable Development Goals. And in September of that year, Pope Francis addressed the United Nations in New York at the General Assembly. That afternoon, the General Assembly passed a resolution supporting the Sustainable Development Goals. It was no accident that Pope Francis injected himself into that conversation, and he was very influential in generating momentum for the Paris Climate Agreement, which came a few months later in December of 2015. So a momentous sequence of events. We're five years out now. We're going to hear from two wonderful speakers about Laudato Si and all of those other related events. First, Dr. Nancy Tuckman, a biologist who is the founding dean of the Institute for Sustainability at Loyola University in Chicago. Nancy, we are honored to have you with us today. With her is Dr. Erwin Lotus, a professor of theology at the College of St. Elizabeth in New Jersey who has written extensively on the ethics of energy. She is an Earth Institute Fellow at Columbia University and has written Inspired Sustainability, Planting Seeds for Action and The Paradox of Christian Sacrifice, among other publications. Welcome, Erin. We are glad you are both with us today. When Laudato Si came out five years ago, both of these women were asked to speak about it in many forums and since then have been champions for bringing the message of Laudato Si on care for our common home to their work and a broader audience. Let's start with you, Dr. Tuckman. Can you say something about how you've integrated Laudato Si into your own work and what you hope to be the long-term impact of Laudato? Thank you very much, Kevin and, and, and Nancy and Kevin for inviting me to be a part of this. And yes, I'd be happy to talk about how Laudato Si has inspired me and my work, uh, primarily at Loyola University Chicago. So I am sharing with you um, a slide presentation, a slideshow that I'd like to kind of toggle through to show you what we're doing um, at Loyola University Chicago. So I'm having a hard time getting this to advance. There we go. Okay. Um, first of all, the if we look at the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, which Kevin mentioned, their 2019 report stresses the urgency and the ultimacy of this problem. Um, if we continue using fossil fuels around the world at the rate that we're using them now, within 10 years time, um, we will be operating in a continual crisis mode because earth systems will begin to collapse and uh, we will not be able to rely on the kinds of um, seasonalities that, that our earth has evolved um, around. And so many of um, the kinds of things that we are, are used to dealing with on a year-to-year -year basis will simply always be in crisis mode and will not be reliable. And I have found both Laudato Si and the Jesuits' Universal Apostolic Preferences, which came out um, a few years after Laudato Si, to both be very inspirational. Um, and for me, they're like compasses because they speak truth. They um, sort of get you right between the eyes. There's no, um, 
dancing around and making it sound pretty. They're very um, clear uh, and they implicate all of us as humans that use resources, that waste resources, that consume too much, that produce too much waste, and showing how this degradation of our common home is having enormous impacts on all humanity, but particularly on people who are living at the margins, people who are poor, and the youth. So I, I find Lodato C, and, and I think my colleagues do as well, to be a very helpful guide and, and compass in the work that we do. And also, if you look at the young generation now, and they were surveyed by Forbes just last year, on what are the most important issues facing the world and facing your country, the top four issues around the world with youth are climate change, pollution, terrorism, and the loss of natural resources. So three of the four top issues are about um, environmental issues, and this is really what Laudato C is, is demonstrating. At Loyola University Chicago, where I happen to um, work, it's, it's a Jesuit university, and we have taken on um, the global climate and, and environmental crisis using a two-pronged approach, both really um, putting investment into our our campus infrastructure it, so as to reduce our own environmental footprint. And then obviously also integrating it into the curriculum through education and, and through the building of a new school of environmental sustainability. So first, if I just very quickly show you what we've done over time on our campus, the panel on the left shows you um, sort of our main campus buildings. And you can see back in 2001 when we started this sustainability initiative, our buildings were sort of color coded as yellow and red. And if you look at the energy use intensity um, on the scale on the bottom, you'll see that the, the hotter the color, the more energy is required to keep it warm in the winter and to keep it cooled in the summer. So we've really moved towards making our buildings much more energy efficient. Um, we've done a lot of work on our landscaping and we have um, now 13 LEED certified buildings. We have a lot, we have a big geothermal system that heats and cools one of our new buildings. Um, and, and so there's been a very big integrated approach into um, rejuvenating our campus to make it have a smaller environmental footprint, not just using energy, but also in water consumption and waste production. Um, we've also really built a lot of curricula so that we have many majors and minors that undergraduate students can, can take, and we also have uh, programs at the graduate level. So we've integrated this um, into our curriculum. We now have over 400 students who choose the Institute of Environmental Sustainability as the place where um, they will get their degree. You can see, and I'm gonna to toggle through several pictures here, um, the different kinds of experiential learning that our students have, um, really a lot of hands-on problem-solving work. This is a rooftop, a green rooftop, where we do research to try to keep them diverse and healthy. We have a big greenhouse where students can conduct research and, and take classes you know, during the academic part of the year. And, aquaponics facilities where we're growing crops with fish together in a very closed system that produces very little waste and requires very, very few resources. Our students grow um, about 3,000 pounds of food in an urban garden that they have constructed and they also run a farmer's market, a local farmer's market, where they sell their produce and also bring organic farmers, local farmers in um, from nearby areas. So another big project that we do on our campus, just showing you the way that we try to get our students to think about uh, sustainability science. We do inventories of our waste on campus and one of the big um, areas of waste is waste vegetable oil that comes from our deep fat fryers around the campus cafeterias. And even though it's um, been boiled a lot and it smells like french fries, it still has a lot of energy in it. So instead of landfilling that, that waste vegetable oil, we now make it into biodiesel in this reactor, 
Um, and that biodiesel sh um, fuels the shuttle buses that go between our campuses. When you make biodiesel, one of the waste products is glycerin. And so now we make soap out of the glycerin and the soap is distributed in all of the bathrooms on um, all three of our campuses. And then right now we've kind of converted, we've shut our biodiesel lab down because we don't have any students on campus. And we've converted the biodiesel lab into making hand sanitizer that we are using on our campuses. And just as my final slide, I think one of the most impactful things that we've done at Loyola is that we've made our um, entry level science, required science course and environmental issues course. So that means that every single student on our campus, regardless of their major, is required to take this course um, you know, before they graduate. So we're really trying to raise awareness about environmental issues and transform our students. I'll stop there so that we can move on to Aaron now. Well, thank you very much and, and very impressive. I'm thinking everybody should probably find a way to get to Loyola. Erin, uh, you wanna tell us where you are and what's happening? Sure, I am waiting for my video to um, appear. It seems to be lagging a bit, but I will maybe begin with my screen and uh, say that I am so delighted uh, to be here with uh, Dr. Tuckman, what an inspiring witness from Loyola University Chicago. That was really inspirational and what a model for all of our Catholic institutions to follow. So thank you so much, Dr. Tuckman. And very personally, I would like to thank everybody who has joined us on this webinar today. All of us, I know, are longtime environmental activists, advocates, gardeners, prayers, contemplative lifestyle changers, and thank you for your work. And I hope that um, the time that we're sharing together today inspires us uh, all the more because um, this is incredibly urgent work and what you are all doing as leaders is so important. When Laudato Si um, began to be whispered about as a as a possibility in two 2013, we heard that Pope Francis might be writing an encyclical on the environment. And that was about the most exciting news I had ever heard. Um, by then I had been an ecological theologian for about 10 years. And to think that the Pope would write an entire encyclical on the environment was heart stopping. Before Laudato Si, we had ecological teachings of many kinds. We had scripture. We had what I still love is uh, St. John Paul II's World Day of Peace message from 1990, 30 years ago. Beautiful sections of Benedict's uh, encyclical, work from our United States Catholic Conference of Bishops. The Global Bishops, many writings, and especially their radical um, appeals to the UN at the Lima and Paris conferences. Um, and then under the category of theological and ethical writings, we have whole libraries. There are dozens, thousands of writings, essays, books uh, by theologians, environmental philosophers, environmental ethicists, not to mention all of our colleagues in the social and natural sciences. But with Laudato Si, what we had is a incredibly evident concentration upon the interlinkage of care for the poor and care for the earth. And the history of Catholic social teaching was evident in three ways. Um, it, it's original focus on the industrial age and the worker, then a large section in the middle of the, uh, the previous century on just and in integral development. But now we saw into ecological integrity coming to the fore with a call to spiritual and ecological conversion with a, with a strong and trenchant emphasis on inequity and global debt, with a hammering insistence that we replace fossil fuels 
and a theological reflection on the community of creation and just the inescapable recognition that the cry of the poor and the earth are one. Before La Si, I had been working on Catholic energy ethics with other colleagues uh, through the Catholic Theological Society of America, and we drew on many of these previous resources. However, after La Si, the most forceful message emerged from the Pope's brilliant writing from his relentless exposure of corruption and uh, in inequity. And we could see how much pollution, exploitation, and violence were harming the poor around the world, precisely where fossil fuels were also degrading our sister, Mother Earth. These images are all from Nigeria, where the, the story of, of colonial and post-colonial extraction is a, is a story of incredible violence, loss, inequity, and uh, degradation. It's a story of urgency. We see how in order to meet the uh, 1.5 degrees Celsius carbon budget, we will have to uh, phase out the use of fossil fuels uh, on a business as usual trajectory by 2025. The urgency cannot be overstated and the Pope has lifted this up by enabling the church to focus uh, by publishing a single encyclical on this topic. And he's emphasized the role of justice, the imperative that advanced nations take sacrificial action, sharing their technology, limiting their own emissions to allow developing nations to feed their own development. Uh, that advanced nations have the primary responsibility to allow developed nations to use what is left in the carbon budget and use their scientific acumen to create the alternative, the alternative technologies and scale them up without delay. So with that, I'll turn it back over to Kevin because that's how my work has primarily been influenced by Laudato Si, seeing the centrality of the cry of the, of the poor and of the earth together and calling us all to embark on an ecological conversion. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Erin, and thank you for the, the theological perspective. And I, I emphasize as well, uh, just with my colleagues in religious studies here, the thrilling idea that a pope was going to focus an encyclical, an entire encyclical on care for the earth was a wonderful, wonderful prospect. Even especially we had a, a, a member of our group at the very forum, uh, Rabbi Larry Troster, who was well known to many people in the world of environment. He was beside himself with delight to think that this was going to happen. And he was one of the big cheerleaders for Laudato Si as it went out. Uh, if we could sort of put this overhead question out to either Nancy or uh, Aaron. Uh, a question here about the impact that the encyclical has had on the global thinking about the environment, uh, particularly climate change and links to Paris Accord and the poor. I think you touched each of you on those bits as we went by the quick survey. Maybe we could return to that and go a little deeper on the impact that it's had and uh, particularly with respect to uh, concerns that were voiced from the UN. Uh, who would like to go first on that one? Nancy, you have to unmute. Right, thank you. I will jump in. Um, I, I think what has happened on a global level is it's both um, raised awareness about the urgency of this issue and how um, connected it is to our own health and the health of future generations, the ability for people to even live on this planet. Um, but I also think that it's really inspired a lot of new action. Um, the, the global Catholic climate movement, for example, um, big groups that are sort of coming together, coalescing, there's a group in uh, among the Jesuits called Eco Jesuit, which is very active. 
And these are global groups which are um, calling on Laudato Si and, and raising awareness, but also calling people to action. Um, and I think the more that these types of, of groups um, really build momentum and, and you know, get work out there and get, get parishes involved, we also see it moving into you know, other sects. Um, youth groups for certainly have been very dynamic in global climate marches. Um, and I also think that there's a lot of tie between the UN Sustainable Development Goals and Laudato Si. I would add that we've seen the linkage between faith and climate action go both ways, both the spirituality of green and the green of spirituality. That instead of looking at the climate crisis as an energy crisis or a technological crisis, or a science crisis, or as a carbon crisis. Pope Francis has taught us that it is a human crisis. It is a crisis of love and of justice. It is a crisis of caring and ethics. And it is far more than simply a technological issue. Secondly, it's about the green of spirituality. Previously, it's been easy for very many to say that caring for the climate is a hobby of green environmentalists. It's a activity of some within the church who find it to be their ministry, who, who find it congenial. The bird watchers, the gardeners, the, dare I say it, the hippies and the Sierra Club members. But now Pope Francis has told us that to care for creation is neither optional nor secondary. It is an essential part of living a life of Christian virtue. So the call to care for our sister, Mother Earth, is not something any Christian, any Catholic can put aside. Yes, thank you. I, I think uh, he was very specific even in the text to say he's adding it to the uh, compendium of Catholic social teaching. Although he did address it to the world, he was making it very clear that uh, this is part of our, how to be a Catholic. You can't do a <clears throat> sidestep around this one. Um, I, I wonder if uh, I could push back in the direction of the Paris Accord. Um, do we have any thoughts about that? And especially in light of the fact that uh, the USA has announced it will be withdrawing uh, and uh, that the Holy Father had made a very big push to get that Paris Accord to really happen. Does someone wanna talk about that a few minutes? It's been um, low visibility, I think, for Catholics in the pews to see environmental advocacy as something they're called to, you know, writing their congresspersons and writing their senators on behalf of uh, national legislation. Uh, we see that a lot in um, so many faith coalitions online. We see that in the Covenant. We see that in the GCCM, the Global Catholic Climate Movement. Um, we see it from Green Faith. We, and we see it from the Forum on Religion and Ecology. But do we see this call to make the advocacy for um, national legislation and national participation in international accords as something that we as Catholics should do. I'm not sure we've seen that. And so for that reason, I'm very encouraged by the fact that this webinar is co-sponsored by two archdiocesan organizations. We need to see the further institutionalization of uh, environmental advocacy within our parishes and to know that it's not just about bringing your bag and your bottle, it's about writing your senator and telling them that you support the Paris Accord. It's about writing your senator and telling them that you want the Green Climate Fund to be fully funded, that we support technology transfer and the scaling up of solar, uh, wind, um, and storage, energy, R&D. So this is um, a, a stage in the uh, ongoing development of U.S. Catholic 
environmentalism that needs to be supercharged. And I also get a lot of hope from the work that the Catholic Climate Covenant is doing and began in their Creighton conference last year, trying to further amp this through um, the institutions. And of course, the uh, global Catholic climate movement has been doing unbelievable organizing. We need to see this at, at an institutional level affirmed by our parishes, by our bishops, by our dioceses. And so again, I'm pleased that this event is co-sponsored by two archdiocesan organizations. Yes, good encouragement there. Thank you, Erin. Nancy, wh where do you see yourself on this part of it? I. I think those are really good points that Aaron's making, that we do have to be more committed to um, moving this forward in, in our legislation and for whom we vote. Um, I would say that when Trump pulled out of the um, Paris Accord, it was an enormous disappointment, of course, but what came um, in the wake of that is the We Are Still In movement, which probably most people um, participating are either a member of or, or very much aware of. The We Are Still In movement um, is, uh, well, Jerry Brown, the, the previous governor of um, California, and Mike Bloomberg out there in your neck of the woods, put together this organization where they are claiming that, that organizations like parishes, um, uh, universities, businesses, but it could also be government organizations like cities and even states um, can make a pledge that they will stay with the Paris Accord in their own organizations. And so their own sustainability plans are keeping them within the 1.5 degrees Celsius rise um, that we signed on as, a, as a, a country to the Paris Accord. So if you add up all of the members of the We Are Still In movement, because it includes entire states like Colorado and California, and it includes thousands of members, the gross domestic product, the, the worth of all of the organizations, including the states that are part of the We Are Still In movement, is the total is the third greatest in the world, only after the US and China. So there, I guess what that tells me is that there's a lot of grassroots um, work that's happening at the level of villages, cities, states, and organizations themselves that are committed to keeping their greenhouse gas emissions within the Paris Agreement. So Trump hasn't been able to completely pull the plug. Um, and I think there has been a lot of support to keep the momentum on the Paris Accord. Thank you very much. Uh, Aaron, did you want to uh, add anything to that? A little note of, uh, you're both very optimistic, which is very encouraging. <laughs> well, I, I I agree with Dr. Tuckman, and um, I think we've seen just in this pandemic that lifestyle changes can, in fact, have have an impact. But uh, far more is needed. So we need to radically scale up, uh, and for that we depend upon um, legislation, international cooperation, mm -hmm. and uh, the end of the fossil fuel era. Yes, yes. Which, absolutely. in my view, requires uh, excellent consideration of fossil fuel divestment. And there we go. Um, one of the things I do want to put in front of us again for consideration, I, rec I recall, and you may have heard the stories, um, when the Paris Accord was under negotiation in those last weeks of December of 2015, uh, there were a lot of um, Catholic religious who made their way to Paris and were around and trying to influence the process. Some months later, I was at the UN. I was uh, familiar with several of the people who were involved. And one of them was uh, the ambassador of Kenya, Acharya Kamau, who was the lead uh, chair for the Sustainable Development Goals conversation for three years. Not a Catholic. 
and he had, I'd seen him a couple of times and we'd sort of exchanged greetings and he saw me in January in the hall. He's walking by and he has his entourage. He stopped, he turned around, he came right back to me and he looked at me and he said, uh, hello again. And I want you to understand it was the religious, the religious people at that Paris agreement who really, really made a huge difference in how those negotiations went forward. And he said, in particular, your Pope. And he turned around and walked away. That was it. But I thought that was fascinating that he knew all those players and he knew what was going on. And he still knew where really good pressure had come from and how it helped. So I think it's important that as we talk about this, yes, you can have an impact. Uh, you just have to know where to apply it. I would hope that uh, we can have an impact on our own legislations in this country. I'm not as optimistic, but I think uh, I want to underline both of what you, what you both said. Yes, we have to get engaged. We have to engage. We have to be advocates. Uh, having said all that, uh, why do you think there might still be some opposition to Laudato Si? This in the United States speaks to the complex culture we have uh, in our country that is also reflected within our church. There is, uh, first of all, a tendency towards the privatization and spiritualization of faith, that faith is what you enjoy in your own heart, in your own church, in your own home. Uh, I think it was Jeb Bush who said this so pointedly uh, in relationship to climate change, right? I'm a good person. I don't need to worry about climate change or, or words to that effect. Um, and so Laudato Si has received pushback because it engages science. And there are those who say, well, our faith is a spiritual matter. We don't get involved uh, with science. There are those who uh, resent the message, the challenge to the status quo, that a climate change, um, that, that his teaching on climate change poses. And related to that, uh, studies from climate psychology show that the message of alarmism provokes the strongest reaction from people it's even stronger than the rejection of advocacy from people on the political right. We know that one's political views largely determine one's environmental views and that trumps one's spiritual views. But even more significant than political views is a rejection of the alarmism uh, when, when assessed by psychologists. So we have to be very careful about using an alarmist message. It, it prompts an incredibly visceral reaction. People reject it. it. It's not always effective. And then finally, I think there are many, many people who instinctively reject what appears to be a leftist agenda and lump the environment in with that. And so that's why it's so important to maintain a focus on care for creation as an outpouring of our faith, as a fundamentally an act of gratitude to God the creator and an act of solidarity with our neighbors who are our brothers and sisters around the world um, and fraternity with all the creatures who are our fellow creatures and to it, it preserve the message of care for creation as a faith message, as a spiritual message, because at that level, all of us in the pews can be united and can, can stand behind this message with one voice. Otherwise, it is very easy for opposition to the encyclical to develop along partisan lines, which is the end of dialogue, is the end of action. Mm. It's also essential to speak about solutions, energy solutions, because that's what, what people do get behind. Oh, thank you. Uh Nancy, would you like to weigh in on, on that I, issue? I would, just, I would just say those were many of my thoughts as well. I, I think um, Aaron stated it very eloquently, but it's, it's become so politicized that it's, it's lost its, um, 
it's you, you, as a scientist, you can't even use the word carbon in Washington, D.C. <laughs> Everybody shuts down when you say carbon. Okay, it's, so we, very we, uh, it's a toxic environment in many ways. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think, yes, I think you both touched it. Uh, however, let's, let's circle to another point here. The webinar today is called Everything is Connected. Uh, how do you see this connection now in terms of the two enormous challenges we're now living through, the pandemic and the exposure of the racism that's at the base of a huge amount of our American culture at this time? Can you say something about how would Laudato uh, speak to either or both of those challenges? I really um, connect with the uh, the phrase that Pope Francis uses over and over in the Laudato Si, everything is connected. Um, my area of expertise is in ecology, which is really the study of the balance and fragility of ecosystems, their structure, their function. And you learn to understand how connected the bacteria are to the fungi and how connected the fungi are to the ants and how the ants are important for the birds and how, how the birds move the seeds around that the plants um, produce. And uh, in all of these very integral ways, um, nature is, con is, is incredibly connected. But we've also oftentimes thought of humans as being kind of separate from nature. But I, I think Laudato Si really keeps pounding over and over again that humans are, are simply another um, form of creation and that we are explicitly uh, dependent upon other forms of life for our own existence, for our own nourishment, um, and, and for all the things that we need to keep our air clean and our water clean. This is all done through biogeochemical cycling that's all uh, mediated by organisms. And so um, I'm really inspired by and can really relate to the idea that everything is connected. And I think this COVID pandemic has really taken it to the next level and shown how um, when humans really begin to alter environments and for example, um, I mean, the, the AIDS epidemic was also a, a zoonotic um, virus, and that means a, a virus that uh, starts off in other um, mammal populations or animal populations and then gets transferred to human populations. So, um, you know, this is sort of a, another example of that, and it's where uh, humans are um, encroaching so much um, into wildlife habitat that we begin to contract diseases that used to only, you know, that, that used to not be a part of our existence or our experience. Um, I think also the, the, another way that this pandemic is sort of connecting um, some of our other crises, the, the climate crisis, for example, it, it's showing us how heavy of a lift it will be for us to get off of fossil fuels, for us to decrease our greenhouse gas emissions by somewhere between seven and nine percent every year, which is what we need to do in order to get down to um, the point where we're not, um, we're not causing damage to the environment. And if you think about where we are today, I mean just um, a couple of weeks ago, we measured about a 17% decrease in greenhouse gas emissions during the, the worldwide COVID pandemic. Um, and that was in late April. That meant that our global levels of greenhouse gas emissions were down to what they were in about 2006. Um, our greenhouse gases have actually increased since late April. Um, they're a little bit higher now. But just to get that much of a decrease, there were over um, 350,000 people that died. Tens of millions of people were going hungry and are going hungry. Billions of people have been out of work because of this pandemic. I think it underscores you know, the challenge for the world to avert, avert the climate catastrophe um, 
without major structural changes. And so for me, it's been a, a real eye opener. Um, and it, it, it is completely connected to what, you know, these are the kinds of things we we're going to have to give up in order to see our greenhouse gas emissions um, become reduced. But it, but people aren't willing to just give up. I mean, it, it has to, we have to have a world pandemic. We have to have people getting sick and dying and, and unemployment and all that kind of thing. So those are just some thoughts I have about the connectivity. Yes, thank you. Yes, the, the, uh, a, a tiny sliver of good news, but at a tremendous cost. Uh, Aaron, would you like to uh, say something in that direction about this question we had about everything's connected and how do we connect now with the pandemic and racism problems that are surfacing at this time? Well, the encyclical message that everything is connected is absolutely illustrated by the by the murder of George Floyd. I mean, when he cries out, I can't breathe, he's echoed by all of the children with asthma who can't breathe because they live near bus depots or garbage incinerators or fossil fuel power plants of other kinds. We know that environmental racism disproportionately locates the impacts of fossil fuels and pollution near minority communities. And so it is the same looting of black bodies to borrow Trevor Noah's phrase. This uh, environmental racism occurs domestically, it occurs in our cities, it occurs in our nation, and it occurs globally uh, in the mediated in the concept of the ecological debt, which Pope Francis expressed so powerfully that we have used up the skies with the super development of our nation and now developing nations need to also grow. So the challenge of reducing our emissions while permitting uh, the increase of a, a dignified life for persons in the global south is a magnified challenge and exactly as Dr. Tuckman has said, how can we uh, do this without the cost of hundreds of thousands of people dying? And the answer is we must accelerate the renewable energy economy and see that uh, as a solution to the problem. Because this is a way to provide green jobs to promote a green recovery that will provide dignified employment, a participation in a new economy and end some of the disparities, but it has to be very carefully structured for that to happen. Um, and so one thing that advocates can do is become familiar with the renewable projects nearby, the renewable projects that are online or being planned. There was a point made uh, by Climate Access, which is an excellent place to go for information on becoming a more effective advocate, that the right is very good at identifying the projects they want to, uh, to end or, or to maintain. You know, we have, we've all heard of Standing Rock. We all know about the Keystone Pipeline. But can any of us name a, a battery project? Can any of us name an uh, offshore wind project that's coming online and advocate for it and share the good news about it so people are aware that a new future is possible, that there is the technology and we need to upload it. And it's, it's out there to become accelerated. We just have to advocate for it. So I invite everyone to look up Inside Climate News Google that, find articles about the clean energy projects that are happening in your state and become an evangelist for it because this is the way we are going to turn the corner together with our ecological conversion to the cry of the poor, to the simplicity of lifestyle and to ensuring that the changes in our economy um, match our desire for justice and communion. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Erin. Thank you, Nancy. We're a little bit uh, behind our schedule, so I want to make sure we are giving the time to the three other speakers today. We'll be back to Erin and Nancy at the, the question period, but now I'd like to make a shift to 
are three, as we say, practitioners. Uh, we have uh, Bernie uh, Yaswick, we have um, Bridget, and we have Nancy. So uh, we're going to go to, I think the first one up is Bernie, the head of the Care for Creation team in the parish of Holy Name of Mary in Croton on Hudson, a town of 8,000 people along the Hudson River, just north of New York City. His parish team is part of Metro New York Catholic Climate Movement. And Bernie, if you're there, can you tell us about the work you've been doing in your parish? Thank you, Kevin. Um, hi, everybody. I'm Bernie Oswick. Uh, I'm, I'm part of a Care for Creation in, uh, ministry at our little church. We have about 400 or 450 families in our church. At least that was before the virus hit. We'll see how many come back now that things have been opening up. Um, I want to share my screen here and just kind of show you where we're located. Um, we're about 25 miles north of New York City. We're right on the water um, on, on, the, on one of the train lines coming up into New York. Um, we started our ministry um, we started our ministry in uh, 2017 um, and we kind of didn't really know what we were doing there for a little bit. We had uh, one of our visiting priests who was a Franciscan kind of inspired us to go ahead and start off. We showed a movie uh, and got people interested. We tried to keep some momentum going after the initial meeting. We had a, we organized a interfaith climate summit in our town to try to bring everybody together to see what we could do. But after that point, we really didn't know what else we should do and nothing really was changing. Uh, and then we hit upon this idea of having a sustainable Sunday speaker series. So every month, and you have to go with the alliteration here, but every month on the second Sunday, uh, we have a sustainable speaker series with sustainable snacks as well too. And we've had, uh, you know, some of these talks are uh, related to the more uh, ethics and religious aspects as uh, uh, Aaron was speaking about. Uh, you may recognize this guy here. He spoke in December. We also had a Muslim speak with us here too and give us the perspective on, uh, you know, the Islamic perspective on caring for the earth. And we had a young lady who walked in the climate pilgrimage uh, in, uh, for the last climate meeting that was in uh, Poland. We, did, we, we investigated lots of the gamut of different environmental uh, aspects. Our goal was to go ahead and try to educate the people in our parish. And we're attracting much more than just our people. We're attracting um, peoples of all different faith who attend our our series. We try to hit uh, lots of different angles of this um, and we've been getting uh, 40, 50, 60 people at our events um, and uh, it's been quite successful. We've been getting on the radar in our town. Uh, in addition to our sustainable Sunday events, we also have shown a few movies to, to, uh, to let people in. And again, these have been uh, both pe people from our parish have been there and also people f from uh, the rest of the town who would sometimes have a problem going into a parish center because uh, they think they're going to have to donate. All your thing is free. Uh, you may notice uh, in these pictures here that our audience tends to be uh, on the senior side, perhaps on the gray side, we could say. We've been definitely having a problem attracting younger people and parents, uh, even though most of our events are scheduled after the soccer games. We may, so we reached out to try to go ahead and um, set up an event where we had a naturalist come to meet with the children after the CCD programs. Uh, we have a, a, a nature center nearby and they came and, uh, you know, we had a, I don't know, we had a decent turnout. Perhaps this is going to turn into an annual event, but we're definitely struggling to get younger people, parents uh, to our events. 
a big part of what we're doing is that we're interfacing with the rest of the community. Um, we, a couple years ago when the uh, convention was going on in San Francisco, we organized and we are like the lead people in organized in our town, a Rise for Climate March. New York City had theirs on Thursday, so we ended up getting a lot of people coming up to our event on Saturday. Um, that's me with the solar shirt on there. And uh, we had about 250 to 300 people uh, at the march. We had lots of uh, board of trustees in our town, mayors of uh, other towns who spoke. So we put a lot of pressure on our people to go ahead and enact some of the changes. Uh, it, was, it was a very successful rally. Uh, we also, in conjunction with the Earth Day in Croton, we went ahead and organized an electric vehicle car show. We had a couple people, a couple good speakers come in to uh, speak about the electric vehicles, and we had a display of eight to ten cars, uh, all sorts of different models, everything from Teslas to the uh, Chevy Volt, I believe, and, and even Chevy Volts. Today, currently, we're involved with a group in Croton called Croton 100. They are making it their issue to go ahead and lower the carbon emissions or the greenhouse gas emissions by 5% a year with the goal of 2040, us having you know zero carbon emissions in our zip code. So we've given them the platform of, of our Sustainable Sunday speaker series, and then we're working with them closely to rally all the different uh, churches and places of worship to get on board. They have a carbon calculator. We're encouraging different members and leaders in those churches to go ahead and sign up and go through their program. Uh, our group, even though we started out with our little task force of five people in our parish, we've now gone ahead and grown to where we have a Jewish woman who's on our committee, we have a Unitarian on our committee, and we have a um, a woman who's from the Episcopals on our uh, group too. So I just wanted to note that we're all also, you know, in trying to be an interfaith group above and beyond just having this reach to Catholics. And that's all I got. Thank you, Bernie. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm sure there'll be questions in the chat room. I'd like to move right away to uh, Bridget McCabe, who I know has been anxiously waiting to get on here. And uh, Bridget is a rising senior at Notre Dame High School in Midtown Manhattan. Uh, along with three other classmates, she attended the Arupe Leaders Summit, a three-day training course in Catholic social teaching and addressing the concerns of the times. And we're gonna ask Bridget to tell us about that experience and what is happening in her world. Bridget, go ahead, thank you. Yes, thank you so much. I'm gonna share my presentation. Okay, let's see. Oh, yeah, so um, as Kevin was saying, I attended the Arupe Leadership Summit um, the spring of my sophomore year of high school with three other girls from my school. Um, I go to an all-girls school in Manhattan, so it was, it was the four of us. And um, basically, Arupe was uh, hosted by the Ignatian Solidarity Network, and it functioned as a retreat that um, was meant to kind of give leadership tips and strengthen leadership skills, but through the context of social justice and um, activism. So we were able to meet and um, kind of discuss and do activities with uh, student leaders from across the Northeast. There was even some kids from Canada. So it was a very diverse group from a lot of different types of schools. And at the end of the weekend, we were instructed to meet with the members of our school who had attended and come together with a plan of how we were going to, going to apply what we learned into our school communities. So we had so many different ideas. Um, you know, we really wanted something that was going to be able to address all social justice issues. And we decided to come together and uh, the four of us be a social justice committee for our school, um, kind of like serve as a bridge between the student body and the administration and the faculty. So 
uh, kind of making events happen that the girls were asking for. Um, and when we came back to Notre Dame, we were so excited to get started and we really wanted to highlight the issues that girls were passionate about. So we asked, we did a school-wide survey of what, what topics they were interested in and it was overwhelming support for, uh, you know, climate justice and environmental justice. So we chose to focus on that. Um, the first thing we wanted to do, especially since we were working with uh, such young, young and such a young audience. I mean, there are some girls who are only 14 years old and very new to this issue. We really wanted to make sure that they felt they had a deep understanding and um, a basic education about the issue. So the, one of the first things we did was we actually invited Nancy Lawrence and Nick Napolitano in to give a school-wide presentation at an assembly. And um, they basically broke down the entire science behind it and also the involvement with the church um, and how those things kind of connected. And we followed that up with a small group discussions for the entire school, um, um, you know, between different teachers and students um, where we signed petitions and we watched videos and we had conversations together. Um, so it was great for us to have the teaching experience and the education, but then also the ability to break things down and just talk about them. And then um, also something that's really great is that every junior at Notre Dame takes a semester of social justice as part of our theology curriculum. And we actually um, teach Laudato Si and climate justice as part of that curriculum. So we talked about that in religion class this year and it was cool to be able to, we learn about it of course in, in science class and biology, but to be able to talk about it through a Catholic lens as a Catholic school is something that was really meaningful to us. And then also this picture here of the wall with the prompt, why does climate justice matter to you? Um, we took the idea of a Lenin wall, which is the idea of a designated part of the uh, wall in our cafeteria, and we invited girls to answer the prompt um, based on the conversations they had had and the presentation they had listened to. Um, and then the administration allowed us to leave this wall up with all the different colored post-its for our open house so prospective students and their parents got to see it and we got to send a message about what Notre Dame was really standing for. Of course a huge part of what we do as a stand committee and also as a school community in terms of climate justice is our advocacy work so when we heard about the climate strike and we heard that Greta was coming to New York of course we had to participate um, we actually, our school is very close to Battery Park, so we were able to meet at Notre Dame in the gym and then walk together from our school across the West Side Highway to Battery Park where we were able to listen to Greta and all the student speakers. Um, we got such a great turnout, such a big group. We had teachers, faculty, um, and of course a ton of students with us. So that was like so exciting to be together as a community. And we also did this in uh, collaboration with our brother school, Xavier High School. So, um, you know, they came with us and it was a cool moment for us to come together, uh, especially as a, as a school and as a, as a group of teenagers and students, being able to listen to a lineup of speakers that were primarily young people was something I know that was, you know, very inspiring for all of us. And to have our teachers with us and supporting us, um, you know, I'm, I'm so grateful as a student leader to have my administration and my teacher stand beside me with this and help me with this work. So that was definitely a meaningful day. And then something um, that we've really been working on and also struggling with is how to apply um, what we've learned and what we've advocated for into our school community. Um, and a big problem we've been having and that we've been trying very hard to address is um, recycling and being more aware of our waste um, in our cafeteria pictured, we have five different bins for garbage. So we have paper recycling, plastic recycling, compost, um, other garbage, and then we also have a bin for drinks um, if you didn't finish your water bottle or something like that. But um, whether they're just too lazy or they are confused by it, I'm not sure, but we have a very hard time uh, getting 300 plus girls to follow these rules and regulations. So. We're trying to think of creative ways to make this easier for them to follow, more accessible, we're not sure, but that's our current project in terms of uh, looking forward towards next year. Um, in addition, we're trying to cut back on paper waste at Notre Dame and energy waste. So 
that's kind of what we're looking forward to. Um, you know, we only, this was our first year of stand, so we're only just getting started, but we're so excited about everything we've accomplished so far, and we're definitely looking forward to continuing this work. Um, I'll be a senior next year, and I really want to get some more stuff done before I leave, so it's very exciting. Well, thank you, uh, Bridget. Thank you very much, and I'm glad to hear the enthusiasm, but it's very obvious that that's what's <laughs> going to bring you forward. Uh, that enthusiasm is going to translate into really, really wonderful outcomes. Thanks a lot. Uh, we're heading into our final presenter, uh, Nancy Lawrence, who's an educator and member of St. Francis Xavier Parish in Manhattan. Nancy helped found and coordinate the Metro New York Catholic Climate Movement. She's the founding group of five, grew out of the Catholics organizing for the 2014 People's Climate March. So we're doing some history here. They affiliated with the Global Catholic Climate Movement in 2015 after Laudato arrived. And Nancy, let's, uh, let's hear from you. Thank you, Kevin. Um, yeah, uh, I'll just give an overview of Metro New York Catholic Climate Movement um, because Bernie up there in Croton on Hudson is also part of it. Uh, and Aaron and of course you, Kevin, are also part of our steering committee. Um, so five of us came together after that big march in New York, and we decided that we didn't want our interest to end there. Um, the march was great, but we knew we had to do more. And our team grew organically out of that. So the first step was to study Laudato Si when it came out. And we had study sessions in six different parishes, um, coordinated between the six parishes. Uh, and then a second step was to form a steering committee and have monthly conference calls. Um, we now have a steering committee of 15 people from 11 different parishes, two universities, and Sister Carol D'Angelo from the Sisters of Charity of New York is part of our steering committee as well. The New York Office of Catholic Charities and also the Franciscans and the Jesuits have been supportive of our efforts. Each of us organize activities in our own parishes, and then we also help with the collective um, initiatives of Metro New York Catholic Climate Movement. We're in a pretty highly dense area here in New York, so if we plan an event in one parish or, or one parish offers an event, then, you know, we let all of the other uh, parishes know so that those of us who are interested can go to that event. Um, so we affiliated with the chapter of, as a chapter of the Global Catholic Climate Movement, um, and we use their model for our work, which I want to uh, put up here. Anyway, if you look on the left, you can see that um, the work really starts with a spiritual dimension uh, with ourselves and that Laudato Si really encourages us to look at the relationship, our relationship to God, to our neighbors and to the earth as an integral part of our spirituality. So to that end, we've hosted two Laudato Si retreats and several prayer services. During Lent, we encourage a carbon fast, which also relates to the middle circle, which has to do with lifestyles and setting an example and educating others by our example. I kind of call it living Laudato Si on a daily basis, which can sometimes be a challenge, uh, but doing it together encourages us to do more and to take one more step. Um, we also organize events to raise our own awareness and that of others. So we encourage people to participate in the webinars that are offered by the Global Catholic Climate Movement and also by the Catholic Climate Covenant. Uh, we promote the Global Catholic Climate Movement's animator training, which is really good. And I think another session is going to start in July, if any are interested. Um, check out the Global Catholic Climate Movement website. So I'll just highlight several of our educational events that we've had. Uh, we were really pleased to have, um, I can advance, yes, <laughs> to have uh, Cardinal Rebat with us. Um, he's from Papua New Guinea and he was here for a UN conference on um, oceans and he spoke to us about the island, um, the islands in Oceania facing the, the sea level rise and having to relocate um, 
entire islands. This one is from Kiribati. Um, so our biggest event to date was a 2018 conference that we organized. We had 140 participants there. It started a lot of networking and we actually had a meeting, a follow-up meeting to facilitate more networking. Um, we also had Lorna Gold, who had just finished her book, uh, Climate Generation, Awakening to Our Children's Fruit Future. And she's the first one that really kind of opened us to looking at what was happening with the, the youth and, and you know, what their perspective was on the world and why they were out striking. Um, we also co-sponsored an interfaith event uh, to understand the basic ideas and vision of the Green New Deal. So Bernie also mentioned um, films that they've shown up there. There have been a number of us who have done film series in our parishes, which have been very popular. Um, we get to focus then on specific issues like climate change, what is driving it, deforestation, the destruction of biodiversity, uh, the problem of plastic, <laughs> and the need to transition to a renewable energy economy. We've had Aaron speak to us as well, um, connecting faith and environmental work, which has been very valuable to us. Um, we intensify our efforts during the season of creation, which is a five week period that starts on September 1 and goes, which is the World Day of Prayer for Creation and goes through October 4th, which is St. Francis of Assisi's feast day. Um, last fall, we focused on what was going on in the Amazon with the forest burning and also with the Synod on the Amazon. So part of our task in all of this is to try to connect up and make a con well make the connection between our carbon, carbon footprints um, in our own world and our own communities um, to the communities that are impacted by climate change and the damage that is being done to the environment and to encourage everyone to take action on the basis of that awareness. So I have one more slide on season of creation, which was this wonderful mural that was in, put in the back of our church that was done by children and then really looked at a lot by children. Um, so the third dimension in our work is advocacy, raising our voices in the public square being a witness. Um, and we do that through petitions, legislative campaigns, and rallies on the issues that we care about in our city, state, and country. We also participate in climate marches. Um, and, but we do that in a very visible way as Catholics. And uh, you can see that from the slides. There's That slide was from the big Washington DC March on Climate. Um, yeah, we also support the climate strikers and <laughs> along with Bridget, I was also there when Greta came in on her boat and heard what she had to say, which was very impressive. Um, standing next to her is a young climate striker who had sat in front of the UN for week upon week upon week um, because of the climate strike or in participating in the climate strike. And here's another group of young people uh, also uh, having a rally in front of the UN uh, every Friday uh, as, as they could uh, leave their classes. Okay, so um, so a fourth area of our work um, is action for our own environment uh, right where we are and it's connecting the local to the global. So we participate in the shore cleanup along the Hudson River where most of what we pick up is plastic. And we also promote a switch campaign, uh, which we, uh, we encourage people, whether they're renters or owners, to switch their household electricity to a clean, renewable source. And we consider that this is the easiest way for urban dwellers to get off of fossil fuels and lower their carbon footprint. Uh, some of us also work on recycling and composting our parishes. And like Bridget, we found it like people find that pretty confusing to try to get it right. Um, so that's kind of an overview of our work. Uh, as we learn more, we feel more urgency to do more and we feel that we can do it better by doing it together. 
Um, I just want to add that, you know, here in New York, we've been hit very hard by the pandemic and that it has affected people of color far above their proportion in the population. And now the racial injustices are being laid bare before our eyes as we try to think about how we will come back to a full economy. Recovery or going back to normal is really not a goal that we should strive for. We are called by Laudato Si and the cries of the earth and the cries of the poor and the cries of the people in the streets protesting right now um, to not go back to normal, to reimagine how we can restart the economy in a regenerative way, a just and equitable way, and one that creates something better than what we had before. So I invite you all to, if you're in the Metro New York area, to join us in this effort. Um, the, um, the email is on one of the slides that you'll get at the end of the webinar. Thank you. And thank you, Nancy. Thank you, Bernie. Thank you, Bridget, for your wonderful insights into what does this look like at the grassroots level when people take Laudato and take it to heart and then begin to move out where they are. Uh, we're at the point where it's a chance for us to look at some of the questions that may have come in on the chat and Kevin Turf, you're going to manage that for us and let us know uh, what we might want to deal with and who might want to pick it up. Yes. Thank you, Kevin. And thank you to each of the speakers. You've done a terrific job. And we have a lot of questions and we won't have time to get to all of them, but um, I'll get right into it. Bridget, if you could turn your screen on. You're a big fan of many people who watched your presentation. And you're truly inspired. <laughs> and, Yay. Uh, thank you. <laughs> Um, it is for you. Uh, from what you see from positive eco actions from adults, uh, what putting words into action, what are some top actions that you think would inspire your peers, younger people, especially people, younger youth, Catholic youth, to get involved and do what you're doing? What, could, what else could you do, could we all do to inspire more people to do like you're doing? Yeah, that's, that's a terrific question. I think um, maybe sometimes I think the disconnect between, um, you know, something like this talk even, it was fantastic, but, and younger people is kind of addressing them directly and addressing their concerns directly. And I think that sometimes what my peers are concerned about and what I've found that, um, you know, the kids at my school, for example, what they're, what gets them interested and what gets them concerned um, is more directly related to how is this going to affect your future, um, less from a scientific perspective and more from like, how is the world going to look? So I think I've, when I address my peers, I try to um, go at it from less of a explaining the science behind it and less explaining the situation that we're in and more like looking towards the future and how is this going to affect us in 20 years. Um, I don't know if that makes sense, but just as a general um, way of explaining kind of the the effects of the situation I find that like saying hey like our futures are at risk here like looking forward I know it I know it feels fine now but we're talking about our futures you know so that's something from like more the explaining side but in terms of actions I found that um giving providing kids with um people they can support and and people initiatives they can take um you know we see it even with the Black Lives Matter uh, movement right now. Um, if you send people, if you, you know, sending or posting petitions to sign, um, I know there, something that's going on right now is that all my friends keep sending me email formats. So they'll be like, here, you know, fill in the names of this email and send it to this person, um, petitioning them to, you know, whatever it is. And so I think that using social media as a tool and trying to engage students through platforms that they're comfortable with and they're familiar with is very helpful. I think um, I've found that my peers respond to things that are formatted in a way that makes sense to them. So again, Instagram um, is definitely one of the biggest tools I use. And I think that's very true maybe of these groups as well. If they can have a bigger social media presence, that might be helpful. But then also I think something that really excites my peers and something that might be helpful to tap into is political change and the new generations of politicians that are coming in and the new renewed like push for um 
you know, policy change, you know, with the Green New Deal and stuff, especially as many of us are coming of age and getting ready to vote for the first time. Um, you know, being like, here's a politician that you can, here's a list of politicians that are supporting the Green New Deal who have, you know, pro um, climate justice initiatives and like you can support them, you can do phone banking for them. That's what I'm doing, I'm phone banking. Um, you can phone bank for them. If you can't vote, uh, you can support their campaign. So I think um, also politics, from what I've experienced and the discussions I've had, engaging, trying to get people involved through politics is very helpful for a generation of kids who are inherently very um, politically in tune. So that would be my, I, it, a bit of a ramble, but that would be my advice. <laughs> Fantastic answer. Thank you so much. Bravo. Keep doing what you're doing. Uh, Nancy Tuckman, a question for you. I'm trying to consolidate a couple of questions. Uh, the theme for this fifth anniversary of Laudato C is to celebrate and accelerate Laudato C. And there's some frustration I sense from people who say not all bishops and not all pastors are elevating and talking about Laudato C. Is there anything that we can do to engage them to do more? Yeah, I know that's very frustrating, um, but I think if people uh, do what, we had three really terrific case studies here with um, Bernie, Bridget, and Nancy talking about what they're doing in their communities. If people start engaging and doing that kind of thing um, and somehow bring that to the bishops, the bishops just in some ways seem totally disconnected with the world in general, what's happening in the world they're so behind and thinking about you know keeping things the same in uh in the in the church and it's not helping certainly um francis's um bravery you know really to stick his neck out and talk about things that need to be talked about and, and push towards action that needs to be done um i guess what i would say is the more of us that just really dig in to advance Laudato Si by living Laudato Si and, and, and advocating Laudato Si, um, the more these bishops that are digging their heels in to, to you know, status quo are going to be, um, I think they're just going to become antiquated. They're not going to, you know, I know they have power, but if, if nobody listens to them and nobody, uh, follows them, um, yeah, it, it requires people to be brave and courageous not to follow your bishop, but I think that's what we need to do. Right. If I could add to that uh, and borrow the advice of Dan Misla, the head of the Catholic Climate Covenant, if no one financially supports their bishop, change may happen as well. People in the pews can ask the question of their pastor and their bishop, is my collection basket offering going to a boiler that's powered by fossil fuels? Have we attempted an energy audit in this parish? What is the uh, fossil fuel investments of my diocese? Why should I spend money that is not being used efficiently to power the sanctuary and uh, that is not being directed towards clean, safe, healthy energy. So I think it's a very fair question. Where are my dollars going before I put them in the collection plate? Um, Thank you, that's wonderful. Um, Nancy Lawrence, we have one final question and then we wanna get back. We're gonna wrap up. And Kevin Colley has an amazing visual to share for all of us. Yes, yeah, that's true. Um, Nancy Lawrence, um, there's some questions about resources and um, one is whether or not you've worked with universities and if there are any success stories you have there. And then another related question was, is there a place to find good resources for Catholics who are not fans of Pope Francis? <laughs> um, we haven't really worked with universities except uh, with Kevin Colley's, you know, Thomas Berry Institute. Um, he's been very helpful to us and is a resource to us because he's got a wealth of information with his um, newsletter that he puts out. And Kevin, I encourage you to put it in the chat box. Okay, Carbon Rangers. Um, and then, 
you know, both global Catholic climate movement and the Catholic climate covenant have incredible resources. Uh, it's not for a lack of resources that people are not doing this work. <laughs> There's plenty out there that we've had five years of compiling resources and creating new ones. And um, yeah, I just, I, I mean, I just finished going through the animator training with global Catholic climate movement and, you know, all the animators started producing even more resources. So I just think that it really um, requires that people look at those websites and, um, you know, pay attention also to what Bridget is saying, I think, um, how to get some of those resources and ideas out onto the social media platforms. I think one of the most telling pieces of research from climate psychologists is that people in this country have denied climate science when they don't like the proposed climate solution. If they don't like regulation and if they don't like um, control of business, then they don't like climate change because it seems to require things that they don't like. So when we propose things that are market-based, like a carbon price, like cap and trade, when we speak about the jobs that come from the solar industry, when we speak about the low cost of offshore wind and the fact that this is the leading source of employment in Texas and Arkansas, we are speaking the language of solutions. And then people amazingly are able to accept the problem. So it, it's, uh, it's a question of speaking the language that people can understand in order to become embraced as allies. Very good. Thank you. I'm sorry we can't get to more questions, but let's go back to Kevin Colley to have him uh, finish up our webinar. Thank you all very much. Um, there's too much really came at us this afternoon. It's a good thing. And we had wonderful presentations from our university. Folks, we had really fine things coming out of the, the parishes, and as we say, the regular folks. And I thought we had very big help from, uh, from Kevin out there managing the show, and I'm grateful for all that. I did want to ask everybody just to take one, uh, one slide that I thought would be helpful to us in terms of uh, framing our challenge. This is a slide from uh, the uh, NASA. Oops. Sorry. Program. I'm going to jump in it. Okay. Uh, NASA has taken uh, satellite photographs of the, the atmosphere for a number of years. This is a photograph from the NASA satellite that shows the nitrogen dioxide cover on uh, the northeastern part of the USA for the last couple of years. That's 2015 to 2019. That's the average. But you can see if you're in New York, you're under a very dark blodge, blob of nitrogen dioxide. So that's a product of fossil fuel burning used in transportation and producing electricity. Now, remarkably, we've had a terrible problem in the world. The pandemic has shut down economies. Here is what happens when this part of the world had to shut down their economy. What happens to the nitrogen dioxide that we were putting out? You can see as we come across Massachusetts and Cape Cod, Rhode Island, Connecticut, Long Island, the upper counties of Hudson Valley, New York, New Jersey, there's Philadelphia brightening up, Washington brightening up, Pittsburgh, Cleveland, and Detroit. The atmosphere has improved wonderfully. And if you've been outside the last couple of days, you saw how clear the sky has been, even with this much still in the atmosphere. So we have the challenge now, how do we do this without a pandemic? Because there is where we were. And in, as the phrase goes, no one can breathe when the world is going this direction. And this is what happened with our terrible, costly shutdown. We did begin to breathe again. So we need that to be kept in mind as we go forward in our challenge. How do we uh, make the world safe again, but make it safe for humans 
and make it safe for the planet at the same time. We're at uh, 5.32, so we've gone a little past our time. I would like to say again, thank you to everybody. And I'd invite Nancy, if you have anything that we need to really make sure we get to say at this point, if you want to let me know what it is, and we'll just take another minute before we disappear. Kevin, can you just mention the uh, declaration of commitment before we Metro New York Catholic close. Climate Movement has tried to bring the Laudato Si to life, and we have a declaration of celebration and commitment on the fifth anniversary. We have it on the screen now. Thank you, Kevin. And uh, we prayerfully commit to join with others to one, adopt practices that help us embrace ecological conversion, increase our appreciation of integral ecology by caring for the earth and caring for the poor. We commit to take Sabbath time alone and with others to experience the awe, wonder and beauty of God's creation and to reflect on what kind of world the next generation will inherit from us. We commit to reduce my personal carbon footprint by reducing my use of fossil fuel generated electricity, heating, cooling, and transportation, and to simplify my consumption patterns. I or we prayerfully commit to be in solidarity with those already affected by climate change by advocating for policy changes to reduce our collective carbon footprint, especially our reliance on fossil fuels. And we commit to share this Metro New York Catholic Climate Movement Declaration with others, invite them to join with Pope Francis during this fifth anniversary year by taking action to care for our common home. Thank you all. And we want to thank each of you speakers and each of these organizations. Uh, please be well, and as we say, do justice, walk humbly with our God. Have a great day, everyone.